Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my history series where today we've got just like my channel's bread and butter a historic accident that shouldn't really have happened but people didn't know any better back then and then as a result rules and laws were changed and hopefully it'll never happen again Oh, and it was based in London because London has so much history it sounds boring but it really is not because this is about the London beer flood of 1814 Yep, a flood of beer, you heard that right kids. That happened in London. But before we get on with the video, I want to give a huge thank you to NordPass for sponsoring this week. NordPass is a password manager and general cybersecurity tool that makes your life easier and more importantly, safer. Do you, like so many other people, like I used to do, use the same password for everything? If your accounts are hacked, it's not just your password that could be stolen. Your personal information, credit card details, address and more could all be stolen, leading to serious crimes like identity theft. It's so important that you keep yourself safe and secure online and NordPass can help. I recently had my Spotify account hacked and thankfully I got it back quickly and safely and afterwards I realised I need some form of extra security and then NordPass happened to email me so it's just some kind of serendipity. Seeing as the vast majority of my viewers here are female, I have some stats for us. 49% of women create passwords using personal meanings and memories and 29% use family names, dates and numbers. That makes it easy for us to remember, but also easy for others to hack. Unique passwords with random words and numbers with no meaning are always going to be the most secure. And with NordPass's password generator feature, you don't need to come up with these secure passwords yourself. NordPass will do it for you. On NordPass, you can store all of your passwords in one place. You can use different complex passwords for every website and not have to worry about memorizing them all when you can access all your logins on NordPass with a single master password, which is made even easier with NordPass's autofill feature. And their password health feature checks if your passwords are weak, old or reused across multiple accounts so you can amend them where needed. But password protection isn't all they do. You can securely store your credit card and personal details so you can shop faster. And the data breach scanner can find out if your online account or credit card information has been leaked so you can fix it. And all of this information is fully encrypted. No one else can see what's in your vault. And that includes the NordPass team. If you'd like to try NordPass for yourself, you can get 50% off a two-year NordPass Premium Membership at nordpass.com slash Marie, or just use the code Marie. Plus, you'll get a whole additional month for free. And this deal will be available until the 10th of February. NordPass is one of those things I didn't realise I needed, but now I have it, I couldn't be without it. It's keeping me safer and making my online life a whole lot easier. But let's get back to the London beer flood and we're going to begin by figuring out where exactly in London we're talking about today. We're looking at central London, specifically around the Soho Covent Garden area. Back in 1814, the Horseshoe Brewery stood at the corner of Tottenham Court Road and Great Russell Streets. Both streets still exist today, but instead of a brewery, you now have the Dominion Theatre and a Five Guys. There's not much use or space for a brewery in modern day London. Today, this area of London is filled with businesses, restaurants, shops, bars and theatres. It's a bustling area and that remains the same as two centuries ago. But back then it wasn't businesses, this was homes. Nowadays, you'll probably only live in this area of London if you are particularly wealthy. But back then it was houses squeezed together, poverty, multiple people living in one single room. The particular area that was most affected by this flood was what was known as the St Giles Rookery, a five acre area described as London's most notorious slum in the 18th century. I actually learned in the process of writing this video that the word slum originally derived from slumber, literally meaning just somewhere to sleep. St Giles Rookery was born as early as the 12th century when Queen Matilda founded a hospital for people suffering with leprosy. St Giles being the patron saint of leprosy as well as the patron saint of outcasts, vagabonds and the like. Anyone on the outer edges of society and soon this name drew in these people. Outcast became synonymous with St Giles and as a result there has always been connotations of uncleanliness and unhappiness in this area. 
Over the centuries, St Giles Rookery eventually became a place for the poorest in society, squeezed in together like sardines, whole families living down in cellars underground. This area was busy with immigrants who had fled the political unrest or poverty in their own countries, and particularly it was the Irish fleeing the famine. There were so many here that this area was sometimes referred to as Little Ireland. All the while, just one street over, you had the wealthiest in society living their best lives. The rookery was a maze, small streets and hidden alleys leading to shortcuts through the homes. It was a city within a city with its own pubs, lodging houses and businesses, but it was unlawful as law enforcement didn't often venture inside. But it could have been worse, these people did have roofs over their heads, they were generally quite happy. But outside society had no sympathy for them, they were seen as victims of their own failures. The destitute deserved no sympathy. Poor, criminal, all the people living here were viewed as the same. About 20 yards away from the rookery stood the aforementioned Horseshoe Brewery, the premises of the Mukes Brewing Company Limited. From 1623, a brewery tap was at this location, which was essentially just a dining room with one beer tap. A pub would later take its place, named after the shape of the dining room, a horseshoe. When the brewery was later built, that took the same name, the Horseshoe Brewery. It was owned by a number of different people over the years, but in 1814, when our story takes place, it had been in the hands of Henry Mukes for about five years, a partner in one of London's largest porter brewers. The name is spelt M-E-U-X, which you would think would be pronounced as Mu, as it is a French spelling, but my research tells me that this specific family pronounced it Mukes, so what am I to do? <laughs> The brewery specialised in a specific style of beer called porter that was developed in London in the 18th century. It was a very hoppy and dark beer due to the use of brown malt and it was fairly similar to stout. It was so named because it was very popular with London street and river porters. The Horseshoe Brewery was the sixth largest in London at the time and produced more than 100,000 barrels of porter every single year. In 1810, the brewery had a 22-foot-high wooden fermentation tank installed on the premises. Having these big, huge vats on site was a big thing for London breweries in this time. It was a sign of success, like, look how much storage we need. The bigger the vats, the more vats you had, the bigger the sign of success. It became somewhat of a competition between the breweries of London to have bigger and better vats of beer. And beer could be left in these tanks to mature for several months, sometimes up to a year. In 1763, vats capable of holding 1,500 barrels worth of beers were installed in breweries. But by 1810, this newly installed vat was capable of carrying up to 7,500 barrels worth of beer. Some sources state that it was 3,500 and it seems like that's a topic up for debate, but let's just say this vat held a lot of beer and that wasn't even the biggest vat there. This vat was just the one that would soon become a problem. One historian has written that the biggest vat at the Horseshoe Brewery held as many as 18,000 barrels of beer. It was the 17th of October 1814 at around 4.30pm when a storehouse clerk at the brewery called George Crick noticed that one of the iron bands around one of the vats had slipped out of place or fallen off. The vats were made out of wooden planks held together with multiple large iron hoops, each one weighing about 700 pounds. But it wasn't completely unusual that one of these bands would slip out of place. Apparently this would happen a couple of times a year and nothing ever usually came of it. George Crick went to a supervisor to tell them about the problem but was told that no harm whatsoever would ensue. He was told to write a note to one of the partners at the brewery, a Mr Young, so he could organise to get it fixed and so that's exactly what George did. An hour later, George was standing on a platform no more than 30 feet away from the vat, holding the note he'd just finished writing and was intending to soon send, when the vat suddenly burst. According to him, there had been no prior indication that it was about to go, bar the iron band being out of place. There was no creaking or groaning, no small leak. There was no way to be prepared for what was about to happen. Apart from maybe a bit of foresight that a lot of beer fermenting and giving off heat in a wooden vat might cause some issues. 
George later told a newspaper, I was on a platform about 30 foot from the vat when it burst. I heard the crash as it went off and ran immediately to the storehouse where the vat was situated. It caused dreadful devastation on the premises. It knocked four butts over and staved several as the pressure was so excessive. Between eight and 9,000 barrels of porter were lost. But really, the loss of some beer was the least devastating thing that happened as a result of this explosion. The pressure of over 1 million litres of beer bursting out of this vat sent a tidal wave at least 15 foot high right over St Giles Rookery, specifically New Street that directly backed onto it, a small cul-de-sac within the rookery. The back wall of the brewery was destroyed, throwing bricks onto the roofs of houses in nearby Great Russell Street. Almost immediately, two houses in New Street were destroyed and two others were badly damaged. In one of the houses, four-year-old Hannah Bamfield was having tea with her mum Mary and another child. Hannah and the other child were swept out onto the street, killing Hannah instantly, and her mother Mary also died. Three-year-old Sarah Bates was found dead in another house on New Street. In the cellar of another, an Irish wake was being held for a two-year-old boy who had died the day before. The beer flooded the basement and the boy's mother, and Seville, and four other mourners were killed. Mary Mulvey and her three-year-old son Thomas, Elizabeth Smith and Catherine Butler. The wave of beer took out one of the walls of the Tavistock Arms pub, where 14-year-old Eleanor Cooper had been washing pots and pans at an outside water pump behind the wall. She was killed instantly and her body was dug out just after 8pm. If you can hear a very annoying purring, I do apologise, but I've got a very annoying little kitty cat who has jumped on my lap three times and every time I take her off and take her out of the room, she just opens the door and comes back in again. So she wants to sit with us so she can stay here for a little bit. Hopefully it's not too annoying. <laughs> The beer quickly flooded cellars where many people lived and people were forced to climb on top of furniture to avoid drowning until help was able to come. All the workers in the brewery did survive, although three men had to be rescued from the rubble and many more were badly injured, being taken to hospital to recover. The deaths were caused from a mixture of drowning, being buried in rubble and just from the pressure of being hit with such a fast moving liquid. As a direct result of the explosion, eight people died, all women and children. Over the years, stories have emerged of people clambering out into the streets to get their hands on the free beer, scooping it up in whatever containers they could get their hands on. But honestly, it seems like in actuality, there was a lot more humanity than that. The truth is actually kind of the opposite. At the time, the Times praised people's response to the disaster, the people keeping so quiet that the cries of trapped victims could be heard and rescue be sent to the correct places. Martin Cornell, the author of Amber, Gold and Black, The History of Britain's Great Beers, said, none of the London newspapers report anyone trying to drink the beer after the flood. Indeed, they say the crowds that gathered were pretty well behaved. Only much later did stories start being told about riots, people getting drunk and so on. These seemed to be prompted by what people thought ought to have happened rather than what did happen. It's also important to note that the vast majority of people living in St Giles at the time were Irish immigrants and xenophobia was strong in London at the time. Had there really been people misbehaving, the papers would have had a field day, but alas, they did not. There's one story that persists of a man who did go out and drink as much alcohol as he could and reports say that he died of alcohol poisoning either the next day or several days later. This story is unconfirmed, we don't know if it happened or not. The truth is the mood was solemn in St Giles over the coming days. The devastation caused by the beer looked like an earthquake had hit central London. You'll always get the people ready to try their luck though, and so over these days, watchmen at the brewery started to charge people to view the remains of the destroyed beer vat, and several hundred people did actually pay the charge to come and see. Dark tourism, interest in crime and disaster is not something new for the 21st century. In fact, it's probably less prevalent now than it has been at other points throughout history. I don't know where that money went, I would hope towards the victim's funerals, but maybe that's just me being optimistic. The people killed in the cellar at the wake were given their own wake at the ship pub in Bainbridge Street in the coming days. 
and the other bodies were laid out in a nearby yard by their family so the public could come and view and donate money for their funerals. These people couldn't afford funerals. The community as a whole rallied together and came up with money to help the affected families. But of course, the government wouldn't do anything really, and nor would the authorities. There was a coroner's inquest that took place two days later, where a jury heard from witnesses what had happened. One of the metal hoops holding the vat together snapped and fell off. They heard that George Crick had told his supervisor about the situation and that he had a letter in hand to send to a partner in order to get the situation fixed. He said that immediately upon the barrel bursting, he found himself up to his knees in beer and immediately noticed that his brother, who was the superintendent at the brewery, had to be pulled out from underneath one of the butts. George said that he thought it was the rivets of the hoops that had slipped and not the hoop itself that had broke. A man called Richard Hawes, who lived at the Tavistock Arms pub at 22 Great Russell Street, said he was in the tap room about 5.30 when he heard the crash, the back part of his house being beaten in and everything in his cellar destroyed. His servant, Eleanor Cooper, was buried under the ruins of the wall, standing by the water butt where she had been put to work. John Cummins also gave testimony. He lived at 14 Prell's Place in Camden, but owned some of the houses in New Street, including one of the houses where people had died. He was there at the time and tried to give medical help to those injured and helped search for the bodies. The jury also heard that other than the band being slightly out of place, there were no signs that the bat was in immediate danger of bursting. Perhaps this is one of those things that we can look back on in hindsight and think, well, Obviously, this was going to happen at some point. Having large vats of fermenting beer in the middle of a very busy and overpopulated city was just a disaster waiting to happen. But you don't generally expect things like this to happen until they do, and then it's obvious forevermore. But that's not to say that everyone at the time was blind to the danger. One person who called himself a friend of humanity wrote a letter to the Morning Post newspaper in which they said, I have always held it as my firm opinion that the many breweries and distilleries in this metropolis are most dangerous establishments and should not be permitted to stand in the heart of town. I am only surprised when I consider the immense body contained in these ponderous vats that similar accidents do not more frequently occur. So perhaps people were aware of the danger, but because the people in danger were the poor and immigrants mostly, nobody really cared. Ultimately, at the coroner's inquest, the disaster was ruled by the jury to be an unavoidable act of God. No one was deemed responsible for the disaster. But I would argue that somewhere along the line, there probably was someone who could have been blamed. Whose job was it to make sure the iron bands were secure? Who manufactured the vats? Was there any form of health and safety in place? In 1814 England, I would assume not. So, this was an act of God, and nothing more. As a result, the brewery didn't have to pay any compensation to the victims, and were even given a waiver from the British government for the excise taxes that it already paid in the thousands of barrels of beer they lost. Basically, this meant they didn't have to pay taxes on the equivalent amount of beer they brewed in the future. It cost Mukes & Co around £23,000 at the time to fix the damage, and that's about £1.25 million today. They received a waiver from British Parliament and compensation and managed to save themselves from bankruptcy. All hope is not lost though, as pretty much the only positive thing to come from this whole thing is that the wooden fermentation tanks were gradually phased out and replaced by concrete lined vats. Other than that, nothing changed apart from the fact that St Giles stank of beer for months afterwards. The brewery went right back to business and remained in business all the way to 1921, when it closed before the site was demolished in 1922 to make way for the Dominion Theatre that still stands. Mukes & Co went its liquidation in 1961. Most people don't know about this small pocket of history, and why would you unless you're from the area? There's not even as much as a plaque to commemorate it, as far as I can find, but there is a local pub called the Holborn Whippet who brew a special anniversary ale each year to mark the disaster. Please let me know if you'd heard of this before, because I know I certainly hadn't, and I spend a lot of time in Soho and Covent Garden. Thank you so much for tuning in this week, and thank you to Nordpass for sponsoring this week's video. Remember to check them out in the top line of the description box down below. 
I will see you in the next one. Oh, and if you know of any other disasters similar to this one anywhere around the world, then please let me know. I would love to cover them on my channel. Thanks, guys.